Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Truman Library. I'm Kurt Graham. I'm the director here, and it's always such a pleasure to welcome a crowd out to another one of our wonderful uh, programs, especially on a rainy, kind of dark and scary night, and uh, that you've driven some of you some length, I know, to be here, and so uh, we know you're going to enjoy what you, what you hear, and we appreciate you, uh, you, you being here and supporting us, and we've had, uh, it's just so great to be back in business and to have these programs and uh, to have these prominent authors from all over the country want to come here and share with this amazing audience that supports the presidential libraries, and uh, you're, you're a, unique, uh, a, a unique crowd, and people do enjoy uh, being able to speak to you. Uh, pleased to introduce to you tonight uh, Mr. Steve Drummond, who is an author, educator, and for more than 20 years a journalist at NPR in Washington, where he is currently a senior editor and executive producer. His work has been recognized with many of journalism's highest honors. Uh, before coming to NPR, he was a newspaper reporter in Florida and in Michigan, uh, and has written for many uh, publications, uh, most of which you, of course, would recognize. Uh, he has three different degrees from the University of Michigan. Uh, he lives in Bethesda, Maryland, and teaches journalism uh, when he's not at NPR at the, uh, at the University of Maryland in College Park. Uh, tonight, he's here to speak to us about his new book, The Watchdog, How the Truman Committee Battled Corruption and Helped Win World War II, which was published just earlier this year uh, in, in May. I hope that you were able to get a book before uh, if you did and you didn't get it signed, um, Steve will be signing, signing books out here in the, uh, in the lobby afterwards. So um, without further ado, please welcome to the stage Mr. Steve Drummond. Good evening. And can I just say thank you all for coming. This is uh, still amazing to me that you would come out and want to hear about the story that I, I was so lucky and privileged to uh, tell. I also want to say it's great to be back here in Independence and at the Truman Presidential Library and to really thank the people at the Truman Library Institute for inviting me and setting this up and having me and the staff at the library. It's been so uh, wonderful. And it's been nice too, a little less rushed than the first, than the last time I was here, the first time I was ever in Missouri in April of 2022. My deadline for this book was June of last year. I had to turn it in in June, and I had been working on the book on and off for several years without coming to the Truman Presidential Library. You'd think that would be kind of an oversight. The problem, of course, was the pandemic. I started the book, writing the book in earnest in 2021, the publisher said to me, can you write this book in a year? And I said, sure. Uh, and that was right in the middle of the pandemic and everything was shut down. And so I was um, writing to the staff here and uh, they were saying to me, it's not our decision, we're shut down here. It's coming from Washington, there's nothing we can do. Uh, and finally, in April, I got an email from uh, Samuel Rouché here saying, hey, we're opening up next week. I booked a flight that day, and I came out that week, and I had a really pleasurable uh, week here, um, reading documents and learning, you know, going through the paperwork and uh, sorting through the archives here, and just easing a lot of anxiety that there was some piece of paper in this building somewhere that would blow up my whole story or change the whole book, or, or that it turned out after the fact that I had gotten everything wrong, and so I was able to fly back home to Washington a much calmer uh, person. So uh, it's a great, great pleasure uh, to be here. And even one of the things that happened here was I was uh, in a hallway down here somewhere, walking down the hallway, and it was right at the time when they had said, Steve, what do you think the cover of the book should be? And I'm not an art guy, so it wasn't really my choice, but they were sending me a lot of photos. Here's the problem. Tr Harry Truman, as a United States senator, in this period wasn't famous enough to be photographed really artfully, very few. Mostly what I had was like campaign photos or here's a, here's a picture of him where he's like this big standing on the steps of the Capitol building or whatever. None of them kind of said what this picture does was, here's a guy ready to, he looks like he's ready to rip into some defense contractor or military official. And also we're kind of used to photographs of Truman as president or later, he's kind of older Truman and he's a little round and 
and everything, this period of his life, Truman could still fit into his army uniform from World War I. He was still, he was in good shape. He walked several miles a day. But also, he was, took this job very seriously, and I wanted a photograph that would capture that. So I was walking down a hallway here, and there was a picture hanging on the wall. I don't know if you can see, but that's me silhouetted in there taking a picture of that thing. And I sent it off to the book publisher, and I said, hey, what about this one? Fully expecting, the word is in the author world that the art people always overrule you. Well, came back a couple weeks later, and they're like, hey, we kind of like that. So that's how that uh, came out. So it was one of my side benefits. Um, and I feel like this photo gets, a little, gets at a little bit of the emotion and the tension and the drama that I was trying to capture in this story. And hopefully when you read the book, you'll, you'll think it, it, it came off that way. Later, when I finished writing the book and I was waiting for my editor at HarperCollins, Peter Joseph, to read it and work through it and make changes, I shared it with a few friends, including my boss at NPR, Edith Chapin. And one of the things she said much later, after she'd finished the book, she said, you know, the first thing I thought was, congressional hearings? Really? Like, you're going to get a story out of that? And um, she made it all the way through. She kind of liked it. Hopefully some of you have, uh, too. More importantly, though, how many have read, how many of y'all have read David McCullough's book? Me too, right? It's such a wonderful uh, book, and I was such a huge fan of David McCullough's. And weirdly, um, while I was writing this book, he died, right? While I was writing the book, I was sitting at my desk. I had, uh, I don't know how real authors do it, but I had books scattered all around me on the floor on my computer, and I was just picking them up. And my phone lit up and it said that David McCullough had died. And I looked down and there was my copy of his Truman book open on the floor to the chapter on Truman's World War I service. And it was kind of a, a strange moment. Um, I, I, again, I was a huge fan. But also, after reading that book, me and probably some of you were like, what possibly can there still be left to be said about Harry Truman? And I guess that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. Uh, turns out, in my opinion, I did find some things still uh, to say about Truman and taking a look especially at this three years of his life and how they might even be relevant today, 31 years, believe it or not, since McCullough's book came out. 31 years, I did the math today, I was like, wow, didn't seem like that. My boss, Edith, was right. In a sense, this is a book about congressional hearings, but I'm here to argue, and as I wrote this book, it seemed to me, it's about um, a lot more than that. It's about these young public servants, many of them in their first jobs out of college, who got hired to work on a committee in Washington. And suddenly, at age, age 22 or 23, these young people found themselves traveling around the country, getting on a plane or a train, and heading out to Pittsburgh to go undercover at a steel mill, or heading to Ypsilanti, Michigan, to see what was going on in a giant bomber plant there, or to a shipyard all over the country. These people suddenly found themselves right in the center of uh, the biggest national crisis since the Civil War. And they uh, found abuse and corruption and waste and inefficiency. These young, these young men and women found themselves asking tough questions of generals and admirals and captains of industry. And, um, and if these investigators and their boss in the Senate hadn't been there, in some of these cases, this would have cost lives on the battlefields uh, around the world. So it was kind of an important story. And then, of course, this is a story of Truman himself. And I think a close look at these three years of his life. Uh, it's interesting to me that when I did the math, I, I have several copies of McCullough's book, he spends 44 pages on the weeks in the summer of 1944 while the Democratic Party figured out who was going to be the vice presidential candidate for Franklin Roosevelt's fourth term. Truman was way down on the list from the start, and he ends up, as you well know, becoming vice president. 44 pages on these six weeks or so of drama leading up to that convention in Chicago. On the three years that became before that, the three years in which I argue that Truman essentially learned some of the basic leadership skills that he would need as President of the United States, McCullough spends 39 pages. 
almost every biography of Truman, somehow they spent all the time in his early life and his World War I service and of course the haberdashery. Um, and then it's like, by the time they get to this period of his life, they're in a hurry to get to the really good stuff and they kind of skip over the Truman Committee. It's usually one chapter or less. Check it out. Um, uh, and so that's where I saw an opportunity. One of the things about this book and this story, here's a weird thing about my story as well. Right from page one, you all or me know there isn't going to be some surprise ending in this story. We know exactly how and when the story is ending. You know, there's no, uh, uh, there's no twist at the end. In that very first chapter, a January day in 1941, and an unknown politician walking out of his apartment on Connecticut Avenue in Washington, D.C., right across the street from where I used to live, by the way, we know exactly where we're, gonna, where we're headed. And so knowing this, to me, part of the fun of all this is that we get to watch Truman grow and learn on the job. We know what he doesn't. We know where he's headed in this story. And so each time in this story, he makes a decision. Each tentative early step, each stumble, each surprising victory, we know the stakes involved. If he screws up during these three years, he probably would not have been vice president and president of the United States. And so to me, this story ends up not being about the destination so much, but about the journey uh, along the way. And Truman, by the way, would appreciate that because he loved a road trip. Truman loved to get in the car and, and go. There's a whole book about his, his uh, a very cool book about his um, uh, road trip after the war. But my story begins with him in a road trip. He gets in his car in Washington and he drives out to Missouri. Um, and so this, for me, gives you a chance to have this growing admiration that I did for the man as he kind of figures this stuff out and as he grows from an unknown state level politician basically into a national leader, a man who would be president. I'll talk about that some at the end and hopefully have time to answer your questions. But first I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I came to write this book and how it came together. For me it was a first time author. This was kind of interesting stuff for me and I thought I'd share a little bit of peel back the curtain a little bit and share some of it with you. Um, a decade or so ago, ooh, 21 years ago, uh, boy, time flies, I was asked to write a magazine article about my hometown, about the Motor City's contributions to the war effort. I'm from just outside Detroit. My father was an auto worker. My grandparents were uh, among the many Southerners who moved north during the war to work in the war plants, and, uh, uh, and that's where, you know, where I grew up. Um, and so I was asked to write about Motor City's contributions to the war effort. You all probably know the story. Rosie the Riveter, tanks, trucks, guns, planes, all of that was happening. As Franklin Roosevelt said in one of his fireside chats to the American people, we must be the great arsenal of democracy. This is the greatest military buildup and defense spending program in history. The numbers even today, let me share some, are unbelievable during the war. 100,000 tanks and armored vehicles, 310,000 airplanes, 806,000 heavy trucks, 12.5 million rifles, 41 billion rounds of ammunition. It is this incredible production across the United States that played a huge role in winning the war. It's a great story. It's a story told in other books. Um, my story is about how the government need to keep an eye on all this. And in researching this, and Detroit's role, I was reading up on the war plants, big and small, around Detroit. My grandparents, Dorothy Melton and James Emerson Melton, worked in several of these plants. My grandma ran a drill press. And inevitably, this research led me to a place called Willow Run. Anybody ever heard of it? A few. Yep, it was a big deal back then, uh, a few miles west of where I grew up, a big open farm field in Ypsilanti, Michigan, 1940. Henry and Edsel Ford, Henry, the original Henry Ford, now in his 70s and pretty much losing it by this point, and his son Edsel, in early 1940, they began building a giant factory there to make airplanes. It would have an assembly line, oh, let me show you a picture of it, sorry. There it is. It would have an assembly line a mile long. 30,000 people would work there until briefly my grandfather. It's one of the many production miracles of World War II these are B-24 bombers, four-engine bombers that were kind of the workhorse of the Army's bomber fleet at this time. Get this. At the end of the war, 
One of those bombers rolled out of that building every 63 minutes. When they talked, the Germans and the Japanese, this is why there was no way they could ever even come close to matching that. My grandparents lived in a brand new development a few miles away in a house that wasn't even finished, a place called Norway. They were slapping up. One of the big problems with the, well, one of the big problems with Willow Run initially though, and this is how we get into the story was, the plant wasn't working very well. It, they weren't making bombers. They were, weren't making any bombers for the first months. And uh, the press was starting to call it, will it run? One of the problems was, <laughs> one of the problems was, as I said, 30,000 people needed to work there. There were no places for those 30,000 people to live. And there were no roads for them to get to the factory. People lived in Detroit. It's 20, 30 miles from Detroit. No roads to get there. So it was just all this infrastructure. It's one of many, many problems going on at Willow Run. The government throughout the war would get reports back from, from combat pilots and they would say, hey, this doesn't work or we need an extra machine gun here or there. So the government was constantly demanding changes while these planes were on the assembly line. This was driving the Ford Motor Company crazy. They, they had you know, stacks of regulations and changes they had to make and they had to figure this all out. So anyway, in reporting this article for this magazine, I ran across these references of something called the Truman Committee coming to Willow Run to investigate. Here they are at the plant, underneath one of those bombers. There's Truman, uh, several of the committee, the other senators on the committee, some little kid who, I keep wondering if he's still alive, that, that little boy. Um, and, 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 and this was fascinating stuff for me. This is right in my wheelhouse as a guy, son of an auto worker who's, you know, grew up learning all about this stuff. And so I finished the article, but this led me down one of those giant internet rabbit holes that happens a lot uh, to, to the website of this place here, the Truman Library, and to reading about some of the young men and women Truman hired on the staff for this investigating committee. One of them was this guy. That's a guy named Bob Irvin. In 1941, he was 23 years old. He had just graduated from the University of Michigan Law School, go blue. He came to Washington looking for a job. Someone told him, hey, there's an opening over in the Senate Investigating Committee. And he joined the Truman Committee in February 1942. I know all of this because decades later, somebody from here at the Truman Library went out to California and with a tape recorder and interviewed Bob Urban. They had this whole oral history project to interview all the people that knew Truman from all the parts of his life, his World War I combat buddies, his business partners, Everybody who had dealings with Truman, they were on this big crusade in the 60s and early 70s to go interview these people. And wonderfully for me, the transcripts of those oral histories are online here at the library. And so for several years, this was kind of a, a hobby of mine, was reading these stories and accounts. And um, Bob Irvin had one of the best ones, his first job out of the country. As I said, he's, he's traveling around the country. He's going undercover to steel plant near Pittsburgh. Um, he wrote, he talked a lot about how people, notably his boss, the junior senator from Missouri, put aside their partisanship. Nobody asked him when he came to the committee. He said, nobody asked him who he voted for, what party he was a member in. They just hired him. Uh, they put aside their partisanship in the public interest. It was clearly for Bob Irvin, for this young man, you're looking at him at what he considered the most exciting time of his life, the most exciting thing they'd ever done. And I'm reading these stories. This is, by the way, he lived on Capitol Hill with one of the other staffers who you'll meet in a little while. And this is a this snapshot from a photo album that one of the sons of, of these people sent me. Um, and I'm reading this and I'm like, you know, I don't really remember this from David McCullough's book. Um, it's in there, 39 pages, but the detail. And then, as some of you know, I'm a journalist, I'm a reporter. And the reporter in me is reading this stuff saying, hey, you know what, I think there's a story here. I poked around on this on and off for several years as a hobby. Uh, at some point I said to my boss, um, I think I'm gonna take a day off here and there and spend it at the National uh, Archives. I eventually worked up a sample chapter and a proposal, shopping it around to agents. And finally I found a agent and an editor at HarperCollins who said, hey, I, you know, willing to take a chance on the, on the story. And can I just say, Spending your days at the National Archives is for a history nerd like myself, a lot of fun. Spending a day in here, sitting at a table, reading musty old documents, not some people's cup of tea, but for me, it, this, this was the most fun you could possibly do. 
This is the reading room at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Your tax dollars at work, I wrote to them. They said, hey, come on over. They hooked me up with a legislative archivist, a great guy named Adam Berenbeck. And they bring out these documents for you, and, and, and that's you know, part of the service they provide to a taxpayer. I guess we all pay for that. Um, um, and so for the next several years, here and there, um, I started going through the records of the Truman Committee, which take up about 700 linear feet in the archives. I would go there. Adam would pull a cart for me uh, of boxes ready for me. Many of them have not been opened or read since the 1940s. This is what, about six linear feet? So you can imagine how much space this stuff takes up in the archives, years and years and years. And of course, Washington ran on paper those days. Everything was in paper with carbon copy and triplicate. And basically, I would go through these in a day, that's about a day's worth of work there, with my cell phone and take photos. I didn't have time to read the documents mostly, like I had a limited time in the archives. So mostly I just got in the habit of just snapping the pictures. And then as I said, the pandemic happened and shut everything down. Adam would let me know every now and then. He'd say, hey, we're opening up next Tuesday. You wanna come over? And I was like, let's do it. Um, and that's how I got onto this story. The story that begins, as I said, of Truman walking out of his apartment on a cold day in 1941. He had just won his second, narrowly won re-election to his second term in the Senate. Um, and on that day, he was about as much of a nobody in Washington as a United States Senator can possibly uh, be. Oh, here he is around that time. He'd been in the Senate for six years. He'd done almost nothing of note at that time time, there was no major piece of legislation that had his name on it, no Truman this or Truman that. Uh, he had sat there quietly and learned and watched, kept his mouth shut. Again, skills we could use a little bit uh, today in Washington. <laughs> not only, many of you probably know this from around here, not only was he unknown, but he was, those who did know him viewed him as, a, as tainted, as a tool of the Kansas City political machine and its boss, Tom Pendergast, in Washington, among the press and those in the know, Truman was generally kind of disdainfully known as the senator from Pendergast. He narrowly won this re-election campaign, and after a brief break from that, Truman came back into Washington in early 1941, and on his desk were letters from constituents, a fairly steady stream of letters from people writing in about an army camp under construction in the Missouri Ozarks called Fort Leonard Wood. It's still there. Um, as you know, let me just set the scene a little bit. 1941, war, 1941, early 1941. War has been going on for a year and a half in Europe uh, and in, the, in, in China and, and Japan. Um, but the United States was not in the war yet, but just about everybody knew that that was coming, or Franklin Roosevelt and everybody in the know knew that it was coming. And so the United States, once again, throughout our history, the war comes and, and uh, the United States Army in 1939 was ranked... 17th in the world in size behind Romania. Once again, as we've done so many times throughout the nation's history, after World War I, they sent all the soldiers home, they buried all the plans, nobody knew what to do, and the army had shrunk down to nothing. There were almost no airplanes, no tanks, none of the stuff needed to fight a modern war. And, and, and so there was this race to build army camps. So Truman was getting these letters, one of the things that makes Truman so much fun to write about is he decided to check out what these letter writers were saying. Not by sending a staffer out there to check things out, not by arranging a congressional junket that would sweep into town and grab a lot of headlines, nope. Truman got in his car that morning in Washington, D.C., and he drove to Missouri. And he showed up at this army camp, a little guy in a very nice suit and a bow tie, wandering around asking questions, no senatorial fanfare at all. And what he saw there was what his letter writers had told him. There were men sitting around doing nothing. There was lumber sitting out in the snow, going to waste, warping, getting ruined. There were contractors soaking the government for four, five, six times what they should have been getting paid. And Truman got pretty mad. And from there he kept going. He went to army camps in several other states on this road trip, and he found the same thing. He came back to Washington pretty angry, and on February 10th, 1941, he got up on the Senate floor and he made a speech, asking for an investigative commission that would look into all this stuff. 
Nobody, including the President of the United States, was crazy about this, but they gave him his committee, $15,000. And again, one of these decisions that in hindsight you can see was good, he hired this guy, a guy named Hugh Fulton, a 36-year-old prosecutor, for working for the Justice Department, who had just, he had just put in jail the head of a utility, uh, uh, a national electric utility, uh, sent him to jail for like 20 years for stealing $200 million, which at that time was a lot of money, from the American people. Um, and, and this decision, Truman's decision to offer this guy the job, Hugh Fulton, Fulton's decision to take the job, uh, a risk, was one of the best decisions uh, either man ever made. Once Hugh Fulton came on board, he hired a bunch of young people and put them to work, Bob Irvin, who you just met, and some other wonderful young people who through their stories, their oral histories, and through their grandchildren and grandchildren who I've gotten to know quite well, and it was one of the great pleasures of writing this story. I'll take a moment here and introduce you to some of them. This is a guy named Wilbur Sparks. He had just graduated from law school in Missouri at uh, Columbia, uh, at, the, at the University of Missouri. Um, is that in Columbia? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and he went to the Masonic Convention that fall with his dad, who was some kind of local politician. Walking down the street, they run into the head of the Missouri Masons, Senator Harry Truman. The father introduces his proud father introduces his son to the senator, and Truman says to Wilbur, "What are you going to do? What are you going to do now that you're graduated?" "Well, I'm probably going in the army," he says. "I think I'll, but until that happens, I'll probably you know, work at my dad's law firm." Truman says, "Well, I got a better idea. How'd you like to come work for me in Washington D.C.?" He hires Wilbur right there on the street. A couple weeks later, Wilbur gets a letter: "Pack your stuff, come on to Washington," and he worked for the committee. I got to know. Wilbur's daughter, Sally Sparks, pretty well. I spent a lot of time late at night on Zoom calls. Uh, she was very patient answering my questions. She let me know that Walter and his wife, Ibby Ann, were huge in the barbershop quartet uh, movement in the United States. Um, here he is later in life, and it's just one of the things that made him a charming guy. He was kind of the square on the committee. He was very earnest and serious. The other members loved to make fun of him, but he was a very good lawyer, and, and, and he told a good story in his oral history. Here's two of my favorite people on the committee. On the left is a woman named Shirley Key. She, hired, she was the fifth employee of the Truman Committee. She was 22 years old, right out of college, very well educated, which of course in Washington DC at that time, as a woman meant that she was qualified for what? Secretary work, of course, yep. And, uh, but she quickly rose up and became the boss of the other secretaries and she was in charge of greeting people who came in. Early on, Hugh Fulton realized the Truman Committee needed a press man. Somebody was gonna to talk to the press, deal with reporters and everything. And he got a line on a guy in New York City, this guy right here, Walter Haymeyer. Haymeyer came down from New York on the train on a beautiful spring day in 1941. He walked in and he met this young woman here and she said, hey, uh, Mr. Fulton's busy right now. Why don't you go take a walk around the city and look at the cherry blossoms, come back in a little while. Uh, they hit it off eventually. Um, they got married, uh, they had uh, children. I've gotten to know their son Christopher quite well. He sent me these photos right here in the mail one, one time. Um, and Shirley Key, like Bob Irvin said, this was the most exciting job she ever had in her life. Here she was working in this office. Famous people that she was reading about in the newspapers were coming in all the time and meeting them and wanting to talk to her boss, Senator Truman. Walter, 1946, wrote a book called This Man Truman, that a couple of chapters, give a first-hand account of the Truman Committee's work by somebody who actually was there. Um, and it was a great help in, in writing this book. Hugh Fulton had a farm up in New Jersey. He was a total workaholic. He and Truman were the first two people in the office every day. They both kept farmer's office and they were both here at six or seven in the morning. They had a meeting every day and they went to work there. He was a complete workaholic. His wife, Jessie, did not care for Washington very much. So on the weekends, they would escape to their farm in New Jersey. And a couple times during the war, whoops, a couple times during the war, he would invite the young staff up. They didn't have children. He was very fond of the young people on the committee. They would invite everybody to come up to the farm for the weekend and have a, you know, a little break from the, uh, from the work. And this is, uh, Chris Haymar sent me this photo. That's his mom, Shirley, on the right there. And on the left is a young woman named Marion Toomey who got a law degree at 20. Uh, it's a long story, which you can read about in the book. Uh, the headline in the newspaper says, Pretty Miss to Become Lawyer, or, or whatever. 
She was the youngest lawyer uh, in, uh, graduated in law in DC. So of course she went to work at the Truman Committee as a secretary, exactly. Um, she quickly too excelled. She became Hugh Fulton's personal administrative assistant and eventually she would be promoted to investigator uh, as well. Later, she's one of the most fascinating people in the story. Later, and later in life, she became a, she got, uh, got accepted to the Virginia Bar. She, be, she, she uh, became a, a pro bono lawyer working with uh, family uh, law issues free at the Legal Aid Society. Um, sadly for me, I started working on this story years ago. As I said, I started working on this in earnest in 2018. Marion Toomey lived to be 100 years old. She died in 2016. It's a little bit sad to me that I missed her by like two years. I did get to know her children very well. They've been very generous on Zoom calls late at night and, um, and a lot of fun writing the story. Anyway, Truman hired all these people and they got down to work. Their first big report was army camps and it was a bombshell. Front page news around the country. The committee concluded that the United States Army had wasted about $100 million building army camps in the wrong place or in a place without any water supply or in one case they had forgotten that uh, they would need tanks needed concrete roads to drive on and that they were sinking into the ground. All, all kind of ridiculous, absurd stuff. From there they moved on to more reports, airplanes. What Americans learned from the Truman Committee was that the bombers, the B-24 bombers I just showed you, the American pilots are flying were good, some of the best in the world. The fighter planes, the little planes that went down and shot down the other guys' bombers and protected the, the skies from the enemy bombers, not so much. Uh, the ones that German and Japanese pilots were flying were in many ways a lot better. The committee was very critical of the P-40 Tomahawk fighter plane, or Warhawk as it was called. Clearly they failed to recognize the Truman Committee in their report how cool it looked with a shark mouth painted onto it. Um, <laughs> as a little boy, this was my favorite airplane. My father grew up near the factory in Buffalo and he used to go out in the backyard and watch them fly over as they took off out of the factory. And from there, they kept going. In early 1943, another giant investigation put Truman on the front page of virtually every newspaper in the country. And the word that appeared in most of the headlines was fake steel. This is really the story that got me, Bob Irvin told it in his oral history that got me to decide there was a book here. Uh, and it led me to one of the other fascinating and completely unknown characters in this book, a guy today we would call him a whistleblower. His name was George E. Dye. I don't even have a picture of him is how obscure George Dye is today in history. But in 1942 and 1943 he began sat down at his desk on Brownsville Road in Pittsburgh with a pencil and pen and started writing letters to Senator Truman and the committee. In the end, dozens of letters about what he saw going on at the steel plant where he worked outside Pittsburgh. It's, the problem was, he, his letters are so incredibly full of jargon, they're so dense, and they read kind of like a Boy Scout. He's, he's saying all these kind of stuff. The Truman Committee was by then getting a lot of letters and a lot of them they called, I'm gonna use the term used by the committee, crackpots. They put them, and basically this guy's letters just went in the crackpot file. Uh, but eventually the Truman Committee, and I, I, I can tell the long story, realized this guy was not a crackpot. He was serious and what he was saying about the steel plant in Pittsburgh was serious. Here's one of his letters right here. You can see, respectfully, George Dye, Plain 902 Brownsville Hill Road. I would like to send you additional information regarding test substitutions and falsified test reports. You failed to acknowledge receipt of two letters which I mailed November 14th. He was just sending letters constantly and they were just, everybody, every letter would get a con, very, pretty much of a brush off. Thank you for your letter. We will take this under consideration or whatever. I tell in the book and I can tell you later how suddenly they were like, oh my gosh, this guy's for real. Um, and as Bob Irvin and two other lawyers went up to Pittsburgh in a hurry to investigate, uh, George Dye had even drawn them a map um, of the factory and the office where the inspection records that were being fraudulently kept were, uh, were placed. One of the coolest things about, again, I've been reading this stuff online for years. I find myself sitting in that reading room at the National Archives holding these actual documents in my hand. It's a very cool uh, thing.
And, and the story that I tell is how I begin the book, how all this tied into a strange incident in January 16th, 1943 in Portland, Oregon, a brand new tanker ship, literally it never had left its harbor before, 500 feet long, $3 million ship, sitting in calm waters about 10.30 on a cold January night, suddenly broke in two. Uh, the sound was heard a mile away. The FBI and the police raced to the, the scene. This was wartime, so everybody's thinking sabotage, right? Um, here it is. The next day, this is what it looked like. Um, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They sent me a thick stack of documents, in, inside informants, all these interviews, trying to figure out what the heck happened to the ship. And essentially, um, the initial fear was sabotage. That proved to be a false lead. And for several months, the, the reason this ship and the other tanker and merchant ships that were cracking and getting cracks in them was a giant mystery, a mystery that would be solved one day in a hearing room in 1943. You can read about it all in the book. Um, but it led to one of the Truman Committee's giant bombshell investigations, front page news on virtually every newspaper in the country, and the words that showed up, fake steel. Um, and so this is basically, as I'm reading this and writing this stuff, you can sort of see Truman now, a year and a half, two years into the Truman Committee, finding his feet. He's learning, he's, he's learning on the job, and growing to become as an investigator, as a senator, and now suddenly as a national leader. He was learning how to speak in public, never one of his strong uh, suits. He was learning how to talk to the press. Also, he never quite figured out how to, when not to talk to the press, when to hold his tongue. Le he was learning how to talk tough. Truman was a captain in the army. Suddenly he's sitting across the table as a senator, facing the top generals, the top admirals, the most powerful corporate executives in America, and he's asking them tough questions. He's also learning when not to ask them tough questions and when to work behind the scenes. Um, he was talking to the leadership of his party. He was talking sometimes critically to the President of the United States. And here's the cool part, too, about this story. Along the way, Americans loved him for it. Here they found a guy who's seeming to be looking out for them, looking out for their sons and daughters, daughters who were serving in the military, their, their sons fighting in combat overseas. And um, sometimes he was telling them information, sometimes not welcome information, but he was getting the straight information about how the war and how the government was doing. Nobody was super wild about reading that our fighter planes were not very good. We're pretty much used to, in America, we're the best, right? And Truman was bringing tough news to these folks. And one of the early decisions he made as I said, that we see him in hindsight really pays off, was Truman asked the American people for help. He went on the radio very early and several times in the Truman Committee and he said, hey, help us out, America. If you see something going on down at the factory, something wrong over at the shipyard, uh, let us know. And the letters started coming in. A trickle at first and eventually more than 100 letters a day, thousands of them, I've, I've read so many of them. Letters like those from George Dye and thousands of others. With this steel investigation, Americans had gotten really mad. Here was a steel company making profits so that they could ship bad steel that would go into ships or maybe battleships or warships that their sons were getting on and sailing around the oceans. People were really, really ticked off. Um, and I thought I'd share one of them with you. Again, there's hundreds of them, but I've always been fond of this one from Mrs. C. Morlman on Hickman Street in Cincinnati. Here's what she writes. What is the matter with our government that they allow such things as have been going on in our war plants, such as this fake test on steel? My God, man, our sons are over there dying, giving their all, while these crooked, greedy bloodsuckers are sending our faulty material for them to fight with. And they have the gall to say they had no knowledge of what was going on. I ask in God's name, what do you think we parents feel like doing when we hear of such things? I have a son over there, and not only is he over there, but he is turning most of his little pay back into war bonds. That's from Mrs. Mormon um, in Cincinnati. Many of these letters, as I said, were very serious ones like this. A lot of them were pretty wacky, too. Here's something called the Christmas Battle Plane. This was going to be a giant plane with six engines and 88 machine guns and cannons and 26 men were going to fly on it. Anyway, um, tons, there's uh, the hilarious ones in there. 
Um, uh, and I, I got to read them all, and they're quite funny. Here's one that I like, too. It's a fairly simple one at the beginning, a New York man writing in to advise. He's read about the committee in Reader's Digest, and he wants to say, with the shortage of steel, he's got an idea. He's been driving around the country, and he's seen lots of old iron rails above ground, or originally used for horse cars or trolley cars that could be used. I venture to say there are sufficient steel rails unused to satisfy the requirements of the whole world. And then I saw the signature. Did somebody just say that? It's written by somebody named Dinty Moore of Dinty Moore Glass and Bottle Museum. And so I'm saying, is that the same Dinty Moore that made that beef stew I used to eat in college for a dollar? <laughs> Unclear. All my skills as a journalist and a historian have the murky history of the Dinty Moore Beef Stew Company is a little clear, but somebody will hopefully write a dissertation on that someday. Truman's favorite was a guy he encountered who his idea was that every soldier in the United States Army would have his own personal airplane. And at a certain moment, they would fill all these airplanes up with dirt, with the United States soil, and the airplanes would take, over, take off and fly over Tokyo or Berlin and drop this dirt onto the cities and cover them with United States uh, soil. That was the plan. Truman loved that story. He told it well to the end of his life. But you can see through all this, he'd struck a chord. He'd made a connection with people. He was, and they felt like here was a guy in Washington looking out for them. And he'd become, in just two years, one of the best-known public officials in the country. I just pulled this off the wire one day because here's a bomber somewhere over in, in Europe, Truman Committee on it. You know, usually they had pictures of pinup girls or uh, cartoon characters, uh, Daffy Duck or whatever, and here was one that a United States senator made to the front. No longer by this time could Truman just show up at a Navy base or an Army camp. The arrival of the Truman, Truman Committee anywhere in the country was big news, and everywhere he went, he wrote to Bess. The national press would follow. Truman loved to write to Bess and Margaret how much, how little he cared about the press. I don't care about the press, he'd said. And then the next two paragraphs would be detailed uh, accounts of what page he was on in the St. Louis Globe Democrat that day. Totally not seeing the irony of that. It's very funny. Um, and then this happened. March 1943, the same week the Steele investigation broke, this happens. Truman picks up the, sh shows up on the cover of Time Magazine. At that time, that was a big deal. It's not so much anymore, but it was huge then. Here's the headline, Investigator Truman, a democracy has to keep an eye on itself. Um, clearly, he's arrived on the national uh, scene, and uh, knowing where this is headed, we're, we're seeing Truman learning on the job. The other fun part of the story, I mentioned Bess and Margaret, was Truman, as at this time, was a, a, a dad, uh, struggling to have a family life and amidst all this work he was doing and he was working long hours to the degree several times it made him sick and he had to go to a military hospital several times to recuperate. Here he is in their apartment on Connecticut Avenue. These were photos shot in 1943 or 44 for Life magazine. He's become kind, of, kind of famous. I used to live right down the street from this building. I drive by it all the time. It's, it's called the Truman Building now. Um, he was never rich. His letters to Bess that make up a huge chunk of my story are full of how much he spent on his dry cleaning or that getting the car fixed cost $13 or how much he had for lunch that day. He took a bus to the, the Capitol building a lot. Um, and the quiet domestic life that he and Bess had loved so much was about to change forever. Now, by late 1943, 1944, Truman was starting to be talked about as a possible vice presidential candidate. Roosevelt was still up in the air as to whether he would run for a fourth term. Everybody in the Democratic Party was praying fervently that he would. Um, they didn't like the vice president, Henry Wallace. They wanted to change. And so all of this speculation uh, begins, and slowly Truman's name, kind of almost by default, is rising to the top of the list as many of the other much more popular and better known people kind of fell off the list. Finally, August 1944, it's again a famous story that David McCullough and many others have told, uh, the Chicago Convention. Roosevelt gets Truman on the phone and tells him to take the job. There are many funny, comical versions of what Truman thought about that conversation. You can read my uh, take on it. 
But along the way, and so this is kind of where the, the story wraps up. Along the way, Truman and his committee time and again brought Americans tough news about the war production effort. He told them about that $100 million wasted on army camps. He told them their sons were taken to the skies in airplanes that weren't very good. He told them the German submarines were sinking way more merchant ships in the Atlantic Ocean than anybody knew. The Navy pushed back and Truman came back and said, show me your numbers. And, and this Navy secretary had to come out and eat a little bit of crow and say, actually, Truman was right. And that fake steel from that Pittsburgh steel plant had gone into some of those ships. Along the way, he and his bipartisan committee, five Democrats and two Republicans, it grew uh, during the war, they had issued 32 reports. And here, true, here too, Truman had shown leadership. And you see him growing into the job and learning this stuff. He and Hugh Fulton had created a new model for how these congressional investigations should be done. A lot of the things that they did, we take for granted now, but because that's because the Truman Committee started them all those years ago. A model that exists as an example all the way down through the Kefauver hearings on organized crime in the 50s, Kennedy assassination investigation in the 60s, Watergate hearing in the 70s, all the way down to the investigations of today, the financial collapse in the 2000s, that have lessons for how congressional investigations are still done. One of the things that Truman, they, they, that Truman started and Fulton, they would give witnesses advance notices of their, hear, of their appearances and let them read an opening statement. That generally wasn't done before. There was no attempt to surprise witnesses or badger them. There was respectful uh, question, but firm. Hugh Fulton was a bulldog as a prosecutor, firm questionings. They would send drafts of the reports before they delivered it to the Senate. They would send a draft to Ford Motor Company or US Steel or the, the, the Army or the Navy and say, hey, take a look at this. And they would receive back suggestions, factual errors, and, and they would go over them and, and make changes so that Hugh Fulton signals when these reports came out, factually, they were bulletproof. And factually was key too. They stayed away from opinions. They stayed away from grabbing headlines or spin. And they basically just said, here's what's going on. Take it or leave it. Um, and then with those drafts, Truman and the other senators would hash out the details, often over bourbon and scotch in his private office, known as the doghouse in the Senate office building, a little room where they could meet and sit and talk. And one of the things Truman would do here as well was share the credit. He didn't need his name on everything. He'd let another senator take the lead on this or that investigation, even the Republicans. Um, He'd let uh, a given senator deliver the full report to the Senate, take a little bit of the credit. Didn't matter, of course. Everyone just called it the Truman Committee anyway. In another lesson that tr would serve Truman well as president, he showed skill in handling the military. Many times during the war, he'd let them fix the problem himself. He had no interest in embarrassing the military, or certainly not as the head of his party, Franklin Roosevelt, if the military took care of a problem, no harm, no foul, no one would ever knew about it. It's one of the problems of tallying up how much money or how many lives the Truman Committee saved. Often a phone call, a problem went away. The military became very, very frightened of the Truman Committee and they eventually had whole teams of people following Truman around and trying to get the heads up on what he, where he was going next. He would call up George Marshall, Chief of Staff of the Army and say, hey, you've got a problem here. If they fixed it, no problem. When the military, or when a big defense company stonewalled though, Truman had a temper. And that's when he would say, okay, here come the subpoenas. Here comes a public hearing. We're gonna invite all the reporters and you're gonna sit there and answer questions. And that happened time and time again. Um, uh, and, and again, as I said earlier, Harry found himself a former captain in the army sitting across from these top military officials holding them to account. Um, and Truman, learned how to build consensus. And this is maybe where I'll kind of wrap things up here. One of the things he was most proud of later in life, every single one of those 32 reports the Truman Committee put out was bipartisan and unanimous. There were no dissenting voices. He would build consensus. Each one was put out unanimously with all the senators agreeing to it. It's a, it's a record that, especially when you're someone like me who lives in the Washington DC that I work in and cover today, seems incredible and, and maybe, as I said before, some lessons could be uh, learned there. As we know, this story has, ends right where we expect it to end.
Here's his resignation letter as chairman of the committee from August 3rd, 1944, as he prepared to campaign as the vice presidential nominee. The other senators on the committee, including the Republicans, argued, they said, no, stick around, let's keep the work going. Truman's point was he couldn't be head of an impartial, nonpartisan investigating committee and also be the Democratic Party's representative uh, for national office. And basically, that's what he says in this letter, is I have to, I have to now promote the line of my party and I can no longer do this job anymore. And he didn't want to taint the reputation the Truman Committee had established at that time. After he read that letter in the Senate, he left the Senate floor, he went over to the Senate office building and went downstairs. The Truman Committee worked in the basement in a room called Room 160. All the staffers, two dozen or so stenographers and investigators, they all had desks down there. And Truman went around quietly talking with every single person in the room. Some of them were crying. And he shook their hands. And from there, well, as they say, that's another story for another writer, perhaps. This one, for me, was a lot of fun to write. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions or talk about this stuff some more. Thank you. That's what they're saying is, I guess we're going to go sign some books after this. Are we doing that now? We're doing that now. All right. We have questions? Are we out of time? Did I talk too much? Let's take a couple. All right. My fault. Or maybe we're good to go, Kurt. Let's, oh, here's a question right here, sir. Truman somehow uh, got onto the term of $15 billion. He said that throughout his life. Every, there are a few historians, who, no, there are quite a few historians who've studied the Truman Committee. Everyone from journalists at the time to the historians who covered since agree, no question, it's in the billions of dollars. If you just take those army camps or whatever, um, uh, uh, re renegotiating contracts. The government was signing contracts. Oh, let's build 5,000 tanks. How about $200 million or whatever? That seemed fine. Nobody had ever made thousands of, nobody had ever made a bomber every 63 minutes before, so nobody knew how much it cost. What Truman was a big fan of is saying, okay, but two years later, let's go back and look at that contract you signed, and if you're making giant profits, let's get some of that money back, and they pulled back hundreds of millions of dollars that way. 15 billion is about as good or as bad as any number that would exist. Same with the question of how many lives did they save. The landing boats that we've seen famously in every movie about D-Day or these invasion that went ashore and dropped a ramp down, the Navy had a terrible design for them and stuck with it since. There was a New Orleans boat builder named Andrew Higgins who had a much better design. The Navy didn't like him. He was a bit of a loudmouth and kind of a jerk, but he was a brilliant boat designer. He came to Truman and said, help me out here. Truman said, oh, here's an idea. Let's take your boat and the Navy's boat and let's put a 30-ton tank on each one and let's run him through the choppy waters and see which one works better. Higgins's boat uh, sailed through the water, delivered its tank on the shore down at, off Norfolk, Virginia, and then came back to circle around the Navy boat, which was almost sinking with this heavy <laughs> tank on there. And the Navy finally said, no, okay, and they ordered. I mean, time and time again, Truman did stuff like this. How many lives were saved because men didn't drown on these terrible Navy boats? Uncalculable, certainly thousands, and this happened with aircraft engines, all kind of different investigations. One more question here and then, we should, yes, sir. What surprised you the most about the Um, That's a really good question. Let me think about this. That nobody had ever told this story before. That may be not quite the answer that you want. You're, I'm just reading this stuff and I'm like, this is amazing. These guys literally going undercover in these plants and going all over the country and Part of my fear was like, sure, you know, I started to think about writing a book about this. Somebody must have told this before. And it was just shocking to me, especially when you go back, the Truman Committee, the headlines are everywhere that nobody had ever done this story before. And I felt really, really lucky to say, hey, I think I'm going to take a swipe at this. Again, a book about congressional hearings is a little surprising. It's also fun, it's fun for me how quietly the reputation of the Truman Committee spread through the military. And they 
By 1943, the military was living in deathly fear. Every commander of a base lived in fear that, that the Truman Committee was going to show up. I write in the book, they came up with all these funny terms for it. They called it Paul Revering, was the way if the Navy heard the Truman Committee was coming, the call went out to the Army base, and the brooms and the sweeps and the mops came out. Everything would get cleaned up. Everything looked ship shape when the Truman Committee arrived. There was a whole... Uh, there was a whole group of these comical terms came up for that. I just found that really funny. They really feared, and, and a lot of them really came to resent, Truman made a lot of enemies in the military that he had to deal with as president from things that they found out. And again, his point over and over again, fix the problem, no harm, no foul, nobody says anything, we'll keep up, I won't, you know, he, he had no interest in going to the reporters and getting a headline if the problem would get fixed. And as we know how the military works and, the, and big corporations work, they would, try and, they would try and stonewall him and that's when he would lose his temper and he'd say, okay, public hearing time, here we go. We should, oh, one last question here, ma'am, sorry. A good question. And again, it's not to say these companies were playing huge roles in the war effort. It's not to say, oh, they were crooked or whatever, but in the steel plant, there was incredible pressure to meet demands. They, they had a, tons of bad steel sitting around and they could spend a lot of money and destroy it or they could just sell it to the government. In that case, a few people got fired. Um, there were investigations, there was, there was criminal investigations that eventually fizzled away or went nowhere. In the case of an engine plant that was shipping bad engines to the, Air Force, to the Army Air Force at the time, Truman loved to say that this was causing the, you know, they were putting these engines in airplanes. Um, three officers, three inspectors uh, were court-martialed in that place. Several times the Truman Committee's work led to criminal charges. Often uh, people would be fired or dismissed or whatever. But also, as happens today, big corporations know how to work the PR machine. And, and after getting burned by the Truman Committee, some of these companies started to fight back. Oh, the Truman Committee, this U.S. Steel came out right after this investigation. Oh, well, I guess we have to do all these inspections now. Hey, our steel production is down. The Truman Committee is slowing us down. They're hurting the war effort. Hey, there's a war on. We don't have time to do all this stuff. So just like today, these companies learned how to push back and fight back, and it wasn't always as simple as it seemed. It's the way it goes, I guess. We should stop there. Thank you all very much.